Hi, everybody. And give us a couple of minutes for people to log in and join us. So we have over 100 people registered today to join us, so that's exciting. So we'll give everyone a sec to get logged in. Um, it would be great if you wanted to share where you're joining us from in the chat. We always love to see how far we're spanning here. And I'm going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat to where you can purchase the book today. Just give us a couple more minutes here. Sorry, looks like we're having some technical difficulties with our chat. Just bear with me one second. I'm still gonna give people maybe two more minutes to log in and join us. Okay, hopefully we fixed our chat. Let me know if you're still unable to see it. All right, that's better. <laughs> okay, hello to Nashville, Tennessee, Brooklyn, Woodenville, Washington. I'm not gonna try and pronounce that town in Wisconsin, but welcome. Pennsylvania, hello. Sunny Southern California. I have to say it's sunny in Seattle too today for once. Portland, Oregon, welcome. Wally World, Connecticut, welcome. Columbus, Ohio, hello. Augusta, Georgia. Mableton, Georgia. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and just chat a little bit um, before Matthew and Anna join us. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we love doing these virtual author talks. You know, we started them during the pandemic, um, but it's wonderful to be able to, to keep doing them and connect with people from all over the world, not alone, all, all over the US too. Um, so if you don't know Book Larder, we are 
a cookbook store in Seattle, Washington, and we are all cookbooks on food writing. Um, and we are so excited to welcome Anna Hazel today. She's joining us from New York, where she is celebrating her cookbook, Tin to Table, fancy snacky recipes for tin enthusiasts and aficionados. Anna is an acclaimed food and culture writer, senior editor of Epicurious and author of the books, Lasagna and now Tin to Table. And she's gonna be joined today by Matthew Scaletta of Wildfish Cannery in Alaska a family business founded by Matthew's grandmother in 1987. Um, we're gonna have time at the end of their conversation to do a little Q&A. So if you have any questions for Anna and Matthew, please drop them in the chat and I will get those going at the end of our talk today. And I've put a link in the chat where you can purchase a signed copy of the book as Anna was kind enough to send us some book plates. Um, we also have closed captions enabled today if that's helpful to you. You should be able to toggle those in your Zoom toolbar. And in your Zoom toolbar, you'll also find the Q&A button where you can drop some questions or the chat either way. Lastly, this talk will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel in the next day or two. So you'll be able to watch it back or share it. So thank you so much again for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Anna and Matthew. Thank you so much for coming everyone. It's so nice to see this crowd from kind of all over the place. Um, my book, Tin to Table, just came out two days ago. So if you got your copy, you're probably some of the first people to crack open the book and take a look. And I'm so excited to be talking to Matthew Scaletta from Wildfish Cannery. Wildfish is one of my favorite brands of tin seafood. You'll notice some of their products mentioned in the book. And yeah, absolutely one of my favorite sources of smoked salmon and lots of other cool Pacific Northwest seafoods. So thanks for joining me, Matthew. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the uh, the high praise. That that means a lot. <laughs> that definitely means a lot coming from you. Um, yeah, I so remember I first, I think I first emailed you like a couple of years ago because I was writing an article for Taste about canned salmon. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like under such an ignorant impression that canned salmon was just kind of like this like convenience food that, you know, like not nothing to be taken that seriously. But then I tried some wild fish salmon and it just totally blew my mind. Like delicious, smoky flavor really beautiful tender texture and it just like totally changed what I thought about and salmon in general. Th that's perfect that's the experience you had is exactly what what I'm trying to do um, <laughs> it, you know um, I think a lot of people kind of come to canned salmon thinking about um, just like the the pink salmon stuffed in a can with water you got the skin the backbone you know all the little kind of crunchy bits in there um, and it's it can be so much more than that so yeah do a lot i mean salmon is so important to alaskans do alaskans get a little bit annoyed when they hear people like me calling canned salmon like you know like a watery yeah and i think even so even alaskans are going to be the biggest salmon snobs um <laughs> And so you're not you're not going to find like the big industrial canned salmon in anybody's pantry around here, for sure. Um, but what you are going to find is stuff that was canned at home, um, or stuff that was canned by like a small local local cannery like Wildfish, who kind of does like community community canning. Um, and yeah, I think you know for us here, it's like it's a staple food. Um, there's always like always canned salmon at any function, you know at all times it's always there always within arm, arm's reach for us i'm told that alaskans are really serious about their salmon dip oh yeah <laughs> everyone has a salmon dip every family every person you know <laughs> uh, it's important and it's at every you know every lunch any get together there's going to be salmon dip i love that yeah, my book has a smoked trout dip, which I don't know if it's similar, but mine is like a mix of some cream cheese, creme fraiche, just like kind of whatever 
canned smoked trout you can find a little shallot a little lemon juice mm -hmm. and like it really shows that a canned smoked fish can just go so far in something creamy like a party dip mm -hmm. or a spread where just like that smoky flavor does so much oh yeah that's a great recipe i think that's the secret is like the smokiness with like the fatty creme fraiche or cream cheese. Um, my go-to move is always can of smoke in a can of traditional plain pack. And then just to kind of cut, cut the smokiness a little bit, but stretch it out. Um, and then the usual, you know, cream cheese, scallions, all that stuff. You really can't That's, go wrong. Yeah. yeah, totally. That's smart mixing them because some of the smoked canned fishes are like really, really smoky. Mm -hmm. um i know that wildfish is a family business for you i think nisha mentioned that it was founded by your grandmother mm -hmm. so i kind of i want i was curious to know what like since you've been in this your family has been in this business for decades just kind of like what the last few years of like We've been seeing like the the phrase tin fish trends thrown around a lot. Um, I'm curious to know like how much the last few years of tin fish buzzwords has kind of like changed your business or if it's like if you whether you think it's a trend or whether you think there's something bigger happening. That's a big question. Um. <laughs> So I think I could dive into that. Um, so yeah, so we've obviously been, you know, canning fish for quite a while. So for us, it was like never a trend. <laughs> um, but like I said earlier, it's it's part of like every, it's part of everyday life. Um, you know, as far as the business side, so like our core business was actually built on canning fish, like not as a brand, but as a service um, for primarily like folks in the fishing fleet. Um, and people who are just putting up food, you know, with like their, their home stash or whatever. Um, and so I, you know, I had seen the way, like the, uh, I had see, kind of saw the trend coming, I like to think. Um, I was a chef, I could find dining for about 10 years. Um, and I remember very distinctly, uh, it was 2008, I was, you know, cooking somewhere in Portland and, uh, you know, after work watching Anthony Bourdain. And he has the episode where he's in Spain, popping all the, all the, you know, all the tens. And I, it hit me right then. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> like, this is a thing. Like we have canneries in the States. Like my family has a cannery. Like why, why aren't we approaching our domestic canned seafood like this, like they are over there. Um, and really ever since then, and more so once I, took over the company in 2015, I've been, that's like been my goal has been to kind of make everyone know that domestic tin fish is as good as the imports. Um, and so when the trend started to hit, I felt great because it's like, oh, like it's, it's working, like people are getting it. Um, and, you know, it makes, uh, you know, it made the consumer education half of like our, our job a little easier because people, like now most anybody knows, oh, like, yeah, a tin of fish is good. Um, you know, you don't have the automatic association with like, with a commodity product. Yeah, totally. I feel like even since I started to write about tin fish as a journalist too, people are, American audiences are like more receptive to the idea of tin fish as like a little bit of a luxury too, like something that is maybe imported, maybe you have to spend like, you know, maybe, maybe you're choosing to spend like 15, 16, $17 on a can, which like, if my parents in like a grocery store in Buffalo in the 90s had seen prices like that, they would just say like, get out of here. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think we're starting to think about it as this like special handmade thing that a lot of labor goes into and like a lot of really quality ingredients too. Yeah, that's the thing with it. Um, you know, like you're, that's what's great about this method of preservation. You can take like, you know, 
take something at its peak, like at its perfect state, and you know get it to Buffalo or to New York, being in New York City, uh, still like that height of you know, perfection, I think is is awesome. Um, and you know I like seeing it as a luxury item, but it's also kind of weird because I'm so used to canned salmon as just something you grab for lunch, you know. <laughs> um, I like to think we kind of straddle that world. Like we have super luxury products um, that are definitely leaning, leaning into that, you know, that mindset of you know special occasion. Um, but I also I really think it's important to produce stuff that just any like the average Joe can eat, you know. Totally. Um, is it like have you run a, into any? challenges and just like trying to convince people that like a can can be worth you know 15 20 dollars yeah um it's there's always the initial there's always an initial sticker shock um especially when people have no exposure to tin seafood at all um you know and you're used to tuna you know with a can of tuna is two bucks or something now so yeah you see like 12 15 dollars for a can of salmon it seems insane um, most reasonable people, you know, once they hear the pitch, like, oh yeah, but it's like, you know, small fishery, it's, this is all hand done. Um, you know, you, you kind of make the argument for like, well, this is like the actual cost of food. Um, this isn't some mechanized industrial process, you know, that's just happening faceless somewhere. Um, most people will get it, even if it's out of their price range, it's like, oh yeah, I get it. Um, so yeah. That. Also brings up, I haven't opened it yet. I'm saving it for a special occasion, but I have this very special tin of yours, which um, is very, was very pricey. I think it's out of stock. This yeah. will probably go for hundreds on eBay, but I'm, but I'm saving it for a special occasion. I'm, I'm not giving it up. That's um, your requirement, right? <laughs> I'm going to buy a house with this someday. <laughs> but... I just think that the, so these are wild fishes, gooseneck barnacles. And I just think they have such a cool story. Can you talk a little bit about like how these came about, but also just like what it takes to make a can of these? Because it's like, it's a lot. Yeah, I would love, that's, that product is like so much in so many ways, like the pinnacle of what, you know, kind of what we embody here, I think. Um, so that, product I started with a phone call I got a phone call from a, a fellow named Evan um, he's, he's at a Sitka which is like you know a couple hundred miles north of us here another small fishing town in, in, in southeast and he gives me a call and we chat and he's um, what he's doing is like these uh, provisional fisheries so there is no like nobody goes out and fishes barnacles um, and so he went through the state got a like a temporary provisional permit to test the waters for the fishery. Um, you know, and they do this to kind of see if there's, if there's a market for it, if there's, you know, biologists want to know if there's actually like, the biomass to, for this to be a fishery and for it to be managed and sustainable. Um, it's kind of, it's like how fisheries are born, um, so to speak. And so he asked if I'd be interested in, you know, in canning some, and I was like, of course. Um, <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> absolutely. And so, um, you know, the path like to be for becoming a product was actually pretty quick. You know, he went out and he, the way these are harvested are just are crazy. They only grow in very high oxygenated areas of the sea um, on the beach. And so they go out um, to places where there's lots of rocks and wave activity. And he goes out in a wetsuit with like a scraper um, and just kind of floats there <laughs> in the waves and just like <laughs> pries them up. <laughs> um, and they're harvested in clumps, they're live. He takes them and packs them in a styrofoam box, puts them on a plane, half an hour later, they're here at Wildfish. Um, then that's where even more work, I mean, if it wasn't work enough, <laughs> him harvesting them, even more work starts where we're blanching them, peeling them by hand. Um, and for that particular product, we just put these, we wanted to put them in the can really as unadulterated as we could. So we did a salt brine. There's no spices or anything in there. Um, we just sp spent overnight in the brine, um, went into the can and, and got cooked. Um, and I think we, 
you know, it took, it was days of labor and we ended up with like maybe 300 cans. <laughs> Everybody's fingers were sore and like, <laughs> you know, is it over? <laughs> Please no more barnacles. Um, but uh, I think we ended up with something really special with that. Um, and yeah, the way it came together and like, that's what's so awesome about us being a small cannery like we are, we can kind of be agile. I can get that call and be like, yeah, like, well, let's just do it. That sounds fun. Yeah. They're just like a total work of art. And like for people in the, for people who are watching, if you haven't seen gooseneck barnacles, just like Google image search them because they look like little like dinosaur arms and legs. They're like, so like, they don't look like they would be edible. But when you taste them, they're like really like briny and fresh and have like a pleasant like chewiness to them. Um, and like in Spain, a lot of places in Europe, they're like really a delicacy and they're tinned in Europe. But are you the first company to actually tin them in the US? As far as I know, we are. They're really cool. And I don't, there isn't many. Um, I think Oregon had a, a fishery for a while, a pretty small fishery, and I, I know that BC has some harvesting too, but there's not, you know, not a lot of activity there in the US. Um, I don't think we've quite caught on with them um, the way Portugal and Spain has, right? Um, but yeah, they're great. I heard someone describe uh, the tin ones, at least, as like eating an olive, um, which, you know, the way like they, they were kind of concentrated uh, through the retorting process, which I thought was like a kind of a cool description. Totally. This yeah. also brings up another reason why I'm like so passionate about tin seafood is that often in American grocery stores, it's pretty impossible to tell where the fish is actually from um, and like when it was caught, things like that. Like uh, there's a lot of misinformation, even just about like whether labels at the grocery store are, are really accurate if you know if it says wilds never frozen etc there's like a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of mystery in the grocery store seafood section but i think with canning you can sort of get like a straighter answer because it's often going pretty directly from the water into the can and then being labeled with like the location so you can get like a little more of a straight story sometimes I think about like where stuff is coming from. Yeah, for sure. I mean, because canneries are traditionally at the source. Um, that's how they, you know, pretty much have always functioned. And it's, it's always made the most sense. Like the fish comes out of the water, you want to, uh, you know, you want to get it taken care of as quickly as possible. And like canning is um, a great way to do it. You know, it's like, you know, once it's in the can, you don't have to worry about freezers. Um, you know, the carbon footprint like shrink shrinks a ton. Um, much easier to get around, for sure. Um, yeah, like mo you know, most of our products are coming right from the docks, um, you know, around here. So it's, you know, people ask sometimes ask me about like sustainability and like you know sourcing and traceability, and it's like, I don't know, it's like. It's, it's so ingrained for me. I don't even, I rarely think about that stuff because it's like, oh yeah, like I do, well, I know the name of the guy who caught that fish, right? <laughs> and I forget that not everybody is like, can be that close or thinks, you know, uh, things like that. So it's, it's cool. Totally. Um, there are also like so many, like a lot of the seafood that I write about in the book are like mussels, tuna, octopus, like things that are really, really popular in European canning, but they can also catch and can in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, there's like an interesting parallel there too, like Pacific Northwest, you can catch a lot of these things. Yeah. And it was odd to me that nobody was really canning much of it until recently. Um, it was, you know, salmon and tuna. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's definitely, and there was like, there's been folks doing oysters for a while, for sure. Um, you know, 
a couple of folks doing mus mu muscles. Um, but yeah, it's great to see some of the European influence uh, come here and allowing us to utilize like some of these products a little more widely. What are some things, what are some like ingredients that you can't catch in Alaska that you wish that you could? Or like, what are some types of canned fish that you wish that you could produce? That I wish that I, I don't know. Um, I feel like we have so many options here that <laughs> there isn't much, uh, you know, I mean, something like mackerel would be cool um, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, I feel like there's so many things and we can't, we're not gonna even be able to can them all. Um, <laughs> not a lot of mussels here. Um, so that could be one. There's not really a commercial mussel presence at all. Like you can harvest them, you can like forage them, but that's one thing we can't really get. Are you allowed to farm them in Alaska? Yeah, and there's, I, this is getting, I don't know much about the, that process, but I've, I remember that there's, people have tried to farm them, but there's some technical things with them. I think it's the way they, might be the way they hold on to like the PSPs or something. I, I, you know, don't quote me on that, but there's, I know people have tried and are trying and there's just been like some, some barriers. Um, tons of oyster farming here though. Because oysters are another one where like, there's no actual harm to the environment around them if they're farmed, right? And like a lot of aquaculture, which can affect the waters surrounding the farms. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, oyster farming could be like a restorative process the ecosystem, for sure. Unlike a salmon farm, you know, for instance. Right. Do Alaskans buy a lot of sardines and stuff? Like in Alaska, do people buy a lot of European conservas? No. <laughs> yeah. pride all the way. We've tried to carry it. We carried it some in our, we have a little brick and mortar here and we we put some out there and yeah, we haven't gotten much, many nibbles on it. I know some people do, I do. Um, so it's not, you know, <laughs> there's no absolutes, of course. Um, but I mean, it's, I think people here are just like super passionate about the salmon. Um, what I have found though, uh, in some instances, like our stuff has been, can be an entry point for folks. Um, I've noticed this like with our online sales, you know, like people will, you know, Alaskans in particular will start buying our salmon, they love it. And then, oh yeah, maybe I'll grab a couple of these, you know, conservas or whatever, just to, you know, give those a try. Um, like once they trust us, if we say, hey, these are good too, um, you know. Yeah. yeah, I feel like a lot of people have that relationship with tin seafood where they kind of have like a gateway tin or like type of fish that they try and then they love it so much that it's just like part of their routine and then they need to mix it up. Mm -hmm. A really fun thing about just tin seafood in general is that you can kind of like keep trying different things every week, open a new thing and like you still won't run out of things to try. Oh yeah, endless. I mean, there's so many great tins out there. Um, it just like, yeah, doesn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, like, obviously the recipes in my book are all geared around certain types of tins, but I also kind of just wanted to encourage people to, with this book to like, buy things, try things, taste them with friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did a great job um, kind of capturing the spectrum of, of tin fish for sure. There's like so many cool things. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was gonna, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your journey in the tin fish, if you don't mind. Um, I'm just, just kind of just curious, um, <laughs> you know, like what were your, like your first, you know, when did you first come upon it? Like where did this passion come from? Yeah, I definitely grew up eating a lot of canned tuna and like canned chopped clams, just mm -hmm. kind of like grocery store fare. 
And then I think after college, I got kind of into sardines. And then I went to Portugal uh, like six or seven years ago and was like, whoa, <laughs> there's a whole world of these tins and each one is different. And it's like each one has some family story behind it where they've been making things this way for years and years. Um, and that was just really exciting to me. Like the idea that there's just like this endless sea of things to try. Um, and then, yeah. And I think I started trying to pitch this book to publishers like maybe four or five years ago. And, and everyone was like, no, that's too weird. Like, that's not really cool. <laughs> but, then, <laughs> but then finally, uh, you know, three years ago or whatever, I finally got a publisher to say, okay, it was it was cool enough to write a book about by then. So I think like maybe you and I have something in common and that we know that this isn't a trend, but we probably both benefited a little bit from like, tin fish is so trendy right now mm -hmm. yeah that's 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 story is hilarious um <laughs> not cool enough yet <laughs> you know um yeah i think we definitely do have that in common for sure um I've, it's been cool to see it become cool i hope it stays cool right <laughs> um i mean like anything i think it'll probably it'll uh cool off a little bit maybe i don't i haven't seen any sign of that i think especially with your book i'm wondering if maybe like this is going to kind of solidify or help work towards solidifying Tim Fish's place is like here to stay um you know because this is it's a really good book um <laughs> and I think it's like yeah it's such a worthy addition to like the culture around Tim Fish so thank you yeah yeah I hope that Tim Fish is here to stay I think that there's, I mean, just seeing like the way different chefs, I, I have like a bunch of recipes in the book that are contributed by chefs mm -hmm. from so many different cuisines. It's like, not just like Spanish natural wine bars. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it just goes to show that there are so, like so many people have some sort of like sensory memory of like growing up with in seafood, cooking with it, making this really convenient pantry staple into something really delicious. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something timeless about that, I'd like to think. Yeah, I think especially now, it seems like people are more than ever like excited about stuff that's like simpler um, when it comes to cooking at home. You know, it seems like we're kind of got away from, you know, these giant complex time suck meals and people just want to be able to create something that's like excellent, still excellent, but you know, not put so much labor into it, right? Totally, yeah. I think we have some time for some questions. Yeah, we have some really great questions here. Um, so I wanna make sure we have time to get to them. Um, so I'm just gonna jump right in. <laughs> First question I love, which is, what is the weirdest canned food you have ever eaten or found? I guess it doesn't have to be seafood. Huh. This is for both of us, right? Yeah. At the <laughs> open, open season. <laughs> um, I can, I can feel all... you going, going deep into your memory, Matt. I can probably name a few. I mean, I've had like canned head cheese. Um, <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, some of the stuff that we throw that we do for R and D, um, <laughs> we, can, we can some king salmon eyeballs a couple years ago. I mean, <laughs> geez. Um, yeah. How what were they like after being canned? Because like I, salmon eyeballs, I've had one, and they're pretty just like gelatinous and like like I don't know. It's like eating a snail or something. Yeah, they're just they, they pulverize. Um. Okay. 
There's like, there's like kind of that, that core is kind of left up for the most part. It just it concentrates. Nice. <laughs> Um, another question, I, you y'all were talking at the beginning about um, the traditional Alaskan salmon dip. Um, so someone's wondering like what's typical in Alaskan salmon dip. Um, I think you talked a little bit about that, but are there always, you know, ingredients that are always there other than salmon? Well, it's, it's definitely gonna be sockeye salmon. Okay. Um, and it, always very, pretty simple, like sockeye salmon, cream cheese, um, green onions. And you know that I think that's kind of the base. And then everybody's going to go from there and riff on it from there. Mm -hmm. And Anna, did you did you try that when you were there? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I think just like with maybe Ritz crackers or something. How do you usually serve it? It's got to be Ritz or pilot bread. <laughs> if you're like, if you're diehard Alaskan, you're serving it with pilot bread. Maybe break out you break out the Ritz for the guests. Um, but wait, wait, wait. what kind of bread? Pilot bread. Oh, you pilot. Know pilot bread? Oh no, it's it's hardtack. Okay, okay. <laughs> so this is an old. It's like a, I might have some. I think I have some. Let me grab it. Yeah. Let's do this. this is great. We have like a show and tell element. Okay. We're going right to the source. Sailor boy. <laughs> We don't have this in Brooklyn. No, <laughs> no probably not. Uh, not yet. Um, and they're, like big discs, they're just big discs of uh, big old crackers. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Staple, yeah. Gets uh, the job done. I'll have to look for them here in Seattle. I wonder if they've made it down this far. <laughs> they got to be. I'm sure they're in Seattle. Like, uh, yeah. You know, someplace by Fisherman's Wharf or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, a couple of people are wondering, Matthew, if you're going to be selling more of the barnacles. We are. Yeah. So barnacle harvesting, I actually just heard from Evan. He's he's starting right now, and so he's going to be harvesting for like probably the next two or three months um, over the summer. So we we'll definitely have another run in the works. It'll probably be another small run just because it is so much labor um mm -hmm. but it'll be there that's great are there that's other, like super out there experiments that you're working on right now um yeah we have um a couple things in the works uh one of them is uh i'm excited about the sea cucumbers oh that's hopefully gonna happen that fishery is in the fall like october so we're hoping to work on that then. And then a little closer to that than that is um, like uh, black cod uh, throats, or we call them black cod tips. It's kind of like the, the part right here, um, which is just a totally different cut of meat than the rest of the fish. It's just really succulent and, and good. So we're going to get a bunch of those and nice. uh, can them up, yeah. Um. This is a this is a great question, and it's one I was actually going to ask myself if nobody did. Um, but it says here some trendy tin brands utilize farmed salmon. What's your opinion on overall quality control and environmental impact of these kinds of operations? Yeah, <laughs> I feel like this question is. <laughs> A little bit of a trap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that uh, like there are a lot of there are a lot of good smoked canned smoked salmon products out there, um, and yeah, I mean, like I like to buy canned salmon that's wild caught in Alaska because of the sustainability of that but there are a lot of there are a lot of good products out there i know that you know uh, salmon farms have changed you know over the years like your initial impression of salmon farms like from the 90s that were just these like polluters and um you know these terrible 
you know, ecologically these like terrible things. I know that there's been technological improvements since then, but that still sticks in my mind. When I think of a salmon farm, I think of fish escaping and destroying ecosystems. And like, I think of them, like when I was a kid, like them finding Atlantic salmon in our native salmon stream, stuff like that. Mm. And I know that we've kind of moved on from that. Um, so I think just, I'm just by going to have to be biased <laughs> and say Alaska is the only way to go. Um, <laughs> I think that's, that's fair. Yeah. Um, someone else is wondering, um, and this is a question for both of you, um, how do you like to pair cocktails, wines, or beers with tins? And is there any kind of favorite pairings you have or any sort of framework people could use? My book has like a few suggestions mm -hmm. about that. Like, you know, a few cocktail recommendations here, there. I like to keep a Spanish vermouth around the house um, because if you, once you open the bottle, you keep it in the fridge, it lasts for like, I don't know, a couple weeks before it starts to kind of taste like refrigerator. But it's just a nice thing to mix with a little seltzer and like a squeeze of lemon. Um, and it has sort of like all the like slightly spiced flavors, herbal flavors, a little bit of citrusy flavor. And it kind of tastes like a balanced cocktail, but you're just adding like one ingredient, like pouring it over ice or having it with seltzer. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to channel that like Spanish bar vibe of just drinking vermouth with a lot of conservas, especially like snacky, like for snack time or while I'm cooking dinner. Um, for um, those of you who already have the book on, on page 116, there's a wonderful um, vermouth hour potato chips recipe, which you can see here. Um, yeah. And it is, yeah, it's potato chips with mussels, olives and piparas, like pickled, pickled little peppers. And I feel like that would be so, so perfect with a little cold glass of vermouth. What about you, Matthew? What do you like to pair with a good smoked salmon, for so instance? I think, I think the way to go with the smoked salmon is like, what people always ask me like in the shop or whatever, okay, like what do I, like I bought a can of salmon and what do I do with it? <laughs> and I always respond like, if it's your first time having a nice can of salmon, like you need a beer, and you need to eat the can. You need to eat it right out of the can, with a beer, whatever beer. <laughs> um, no matter what beer. Uh, yeah, like a Pacific Northwest beer, I guess. But you know, I think that's that's like a classic pairing, for sure. Nice. Maybe I'll have that for dinner. <laughs> Excellent. Um, somebody is wondering, um, Matthew, is all your fish brined prior to canning? Do you can with oil? What's the shelf life of canned fish in general? Okay, so most everything we do um, either undergoes like a brine or a curing process before it gets canned. Mm -hmm. Some stuff, um, we have a couple products that we just go in there just raw, um, but it's not, not the usual. Um, and as far as shelf life, that's a tricky question because um, <laughs> I don't know if the FDA is <laughs> is uh, is here or not, but I don't know if they've logged in. <laughs> um, technically, I like oh, we, with the cans we use with like the sanitary lid with no pop top, we get officially we get five years with those, um, and that's one of the reasons like we choose to use those, um, just because like you know the whole canned fish is food security thing is important to us. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, if you keep if you keep your tins stored correctly they don't get wet they don't get rusty or bulge like i've eaten 15 year old cans of salmon um and you sit before us today look at you <laughs> there's this guy there's this blogger named i want to say drew melon maybe who um he had like a blog spot where he would just open Old can well he opened like hundreds and hundreds of cans of sardines and would like write a review um but that included like cans that he was finding on ebay from the 60s and 70s which just really really brave i would not go that far back because by then like the can has got to be kind of like rusting and 
disintegrating. But yeah, pe people really take it to the extreme, I think. Oh yeah, that's that's pretty diehard um, <laughs> for sure. But uh, I definitely appreciate the spirit. We started putting like a vintage stamp on like a few of our, our tins a couple years ago, just to kind of, you know, get that word out there. Yeah, you can like, you can, you can hang on to these. You can lay, you know, certain tins down for a couple years. No more than five, of course. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I definitely encourage people to try that. Um, especially with like a wild product, you know, things are going to vary year to year, like one year, a king salmon is going to, your king salmon are going to be fattier than, you know, one year, um, you know, stuff with additives. Like we do one with birch syrup and like the birch is going to be different every year. Um, so I think it's important to note, like it's important to note the date and that stuff. Yeah, there's, there's like a big French culture of doing that with sardines where like when you have a really good harvest year, like making special cans with the vintage stamped on there and it's like wine where like people collect them open them in five years open them in 10 years it's like a nice little time capsule of like what the fishing season was like that year mm -hmm. um another question is uh about favorite condiments to pair with specific tins uh or are there any condiments you like to keep around to have on hand for Kind of pairing with things. I mean, I really, I really encourage everyone um, to check out the book because there are just such wonderful tips about all those things. Um, but yeah, does anything, anything come to mind to either of you? Tin fish people are like really serious about hot sauce and chili crisp. There, I don't know if anyone in the audience is in the canned sardine subreddit, but they had to make a rule in the subreddit where you couldn't post your condiments because people are getting too excited about about their condiments <laughs> it's just like very wholesome like like yeah everyone's excited about their condiments but ooh, kimchi mayo someone said in the chat that sounds mm -hmm. good yeah yeah like some mustards some hot sauces some chili oils I like a really good harissa with like an oily tuna or mackerel um just with like some olives some pickly things some bread those are my videos. What about you, Matthew? Uh, I like some pickles, like some pickled red onion is always, always nice, especially with like the richer stuff. Um, and of course the hot sauces, like we, here we use a ton of this kelp hot sauce that comes from a, these folks up in Juneau that is fan fantastic. Kelp and it's fun too because it's also from the sea. So it's like, there's like a fun play there. Yeah. Nice. I love that there's a canned fish subreddit. That makes me very happy. And I'm sure there's a lot of good, good tips in there. Um, there are. Okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to take one more question and then we're going to wrap up. Um, but I think this is a nice one to end on. So Connie is wondering what is the best tin seafood you've ever had? Um, I guess if you have a favorite memory or, you know, one particular experience that really stands out to both of you. Hmm. I'm, that's a tough question. I'm mm -hmm. not good at those questions. Um, <laughs> like the best tin? I don't know. I'm sure, because it's like it like almost assumes that like we've already had our best. I know. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's, hopefully it's still to come. Um, <laughs> well, Anna, Anna has a great quote in the book in the introduction that I really like, which is the world is very big and full of tins, <laughs> which I think is a really nice way to to think about it and to to approach it. So let's hope that that our best tin seafood is still out there waiting for us. Um, well, I really I really want to thank both of you for taking the time to join us today. It's been super fun to kind of get this inside track and hear about kind of the consumer side and the you know the canning side. Super cool. Um, I really want to encourage anyone who hasn't uh, got a copy of the book to check it out. Um, it might not be obvious from online, but it, it has these beautiful rounded corners and rounded pages, just like a, a can. And it's the design is beautiful. The illustrations are beautiful. And so many amazing recipes from Anna and from all her wonderful 
contributors and it's it's just a really wonderful book so we're really excited to have it in the store and yeah we hope everyone has a chance to check it out um, and then also I see from the chat that um, Wild Fish are doing a discount code um, for folks here today so the discount code is for 20% off your next order with Wild Fish and it is tin to table all one word and all caps um, so you've got everything you need to, to throw your little next tin fish party. So thank you so much to Anna and to Matthew for joining us. And thank you everybody for tuning in from all over the place. And yeah, look out for the recording on YouTube if you'd like to share it with someone. All right, everybody, have a great evening wherever you are. Bye. Thank you for Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.